there ladies and gentlemen of YouTube, Gav Crimson here again. And today I want to take a look at a film I first encountered on VHS in the early 1990s, but which could have only really come from the nicotine and beer stained world of the late 1960s. Yes, it's Groupie Girl, and as it's known in America, I am a groupie. The sexploitation duo of director Derek Ford and producer Stanley Long scored a massive hit in early 1970 with The Wife Swappers, a documentary style expose of middle class swingers, a subject matter that was rather dear to Derek Ford's own heart. Their other big hit of that year, however, took both men into less familiar territory of the British mu music scene, and a phenomenon that, not unlike wife swapping, was being greeted with an equal amount of condemnation and curtain twitching interest by the British public. Teenage pop groupies. Irresistible as his subject matter was to a pair of sleaze mongers like Ford and Long, if truth be told, both men, then into middle age, were a little out of their depth when it came to serving up a realistic depiction of the music industry and the younger generation of that era. For that reason, Ford and Long sought out a third collaborator for Groupie Girl in the form of music industry knockaround and budding scriptwriter Suzanne Mercer. The end result greatly benefits from each of these contributors. Mercer's script, gender and background lend the film an authentic insight into the female groupie mindset. There's enough exhibitionism, offbeat sex, and yes, a side serving of swinging to fully engage Mr. Ford, while the energetic narrative is a tribute to Stanley Long's ripped from today's headline sensibilities, bringing to life just about every sordid rock and roll story Long must have read about in the news of the world. The groupie girl of the title is Sally, a bored teenage music fan from the Sticks, who the film introduces as, as she is lovingly eyeballing a band at a local gig. Seduced by their songs which promise love and wild times, Sally sees the band as her ticket out of provincial monotony and catches a ride with the band by hiding out in the back of their van. Life on the road with the band might not be as dull as back home, but it is depicted as a hard, thankless slog through same cities and motorways in the back of the band's beat up old transit van followed by sleeping on the floors of borderline squats. No doubt due to the film's own low budget, the band that Sally hooks up with in Groupie Girl tend to be on the lower end of pop stardom. Groupie Girl is certainly no romanticised view of the life of a pop band. Indeed, the film positively relishes exploding the notion that a pop band's life is an enviable one of wealth, fame and comfort. There are no private jets or champagne and cocaine lace parties for the band in Groupie Girl just a penniless back-breaking existence of terrible gigs at local clubs and dance halls, being locked away in recording studios and being bossed around by slave driver managers. Far from being free-spirited anti-establishment figures, the bands in Groupie Girl are just your typical downtrodden bunch of working class lads being exploited by an older, meaner generation of men. Copping off with groupies appears to be the only perk in a job like this. For a sexploitation film that must have known it was going to be playing to a predominantly male audience, there's very little in this film that flatters male musicians or men in general. At best these male musicians come across as immature jokers and at worst moronic methodists who openly refer to women as scrubber or some slag and treat Sally like a complete dog's body. Sally is constantly surrounded in this film by a revolving door of unlikable bad time characters who are out to have their fun with her and then toss her aside which does at times make the film a little difficult to watch, especially as you do grow to care what happens to Sally. If the film is anything to go by, then it's safe to assume that Mercer must have met her fair share of bad eggs and bozos within the music industry. Male characters in this film have a tendency of coming across as uglier variations of what has gone before, something that applies not only to the increasingly selfish and narcissistic musicians that Sally hooks up with, but also their Svengali managers, who are really calling the shots and making all the money here. The first band's chancellor of a manager is like a saint compared to Mori, the manager of Sweaty Betty, a band that Sally later gets mixed up with, and who controls these flower children musicians with a mixture of fear and, in and intimidation. Director Derek Ford, whose later films tended to show a greater affinity towards female characters than male ones, displays a compassionate attitude towards Sally, even if you get the impression that the appeal of the groupie lifestyle was something that eluded this film's director. Wesley, a mellow folk musician introduced late into the proceedings, appears to act as Ford's questioning mouthpiece, at one point asking Sally, what, what are you doing hanging around groups? What kind of life is that? And then delivering what is clearly intended to be the film's key observation, 
You're a groupie, and groupies get used, and when they're not needed, they're thrown away. On the surface, Wesley looks to be everything Sally has been searching for, making it all the more painful when the cracks in his caring, nice guy persona begin to show. As with Rupert Davis's character in Pete Walker's Frightmare, Wesley's cowardly nature is eventually revealed when he chooses to turn a blind eye while something really nasty happens to this film's heroine off screen. In a scene that, like the ending of Frightmare, seems deliberately calculated to fire up audiences' anger, going as it does against audiences' expectation that these men will turn out to be the heroine's knight in shining armour. Alien as this world was to Ford and Long, the casting of largely unknowns and the on the road location work, which takes in numerous views of chilly motorways, petrol stations, car parks and hotel rooms, always feels on the money in terms of period authenticity. To the degree that in recent years director Julian Temple has even worked footage from this film into his documentary Joe Strummer The Future's Unwritten, where footage from the Ford film acts as a similar illustration of Strummer's pre-fame days living in squats and trying to make it the musician in 1970s London. The actual cast of Groupie Gill is a mixture of professional actors like Donald Sumter and Emmett Hennessy and actual musicians masquerading as actors. The final group in the film, Sweaty Betty, was comprised of members of a soon to disband group called Opal Butterfly. Incidentally, Opal Butterfly had at one point counted Lemmy, later of Motorhead, as part of the band. However, by this point, he'd gotten kicked out of the band and therefore narrowly lost out on the dubious honour of appearing in a Derek Ford film. In a backhanded compliment to how convincingly rock and roll the groupie girl cast were, the monthly film bulletin took this film to task for casting the ugliest, dirtiest assembly of misshapen non-actors since Todd Browning's Freaks, a line that could have easily come from one of the film's elderly, fish-shaking authority figures. These days it would be unusual for a film about the music industry not to focus on its darker side. However, upon its release, the pot-smoking, groupie-shagging antics of Ford's film must have seemed a world away from the comparatively innocuous cinematic exploits of The Beatles or Herman's Hermits from the previous decade. It would take mainstream British cinema a few years to catch up with groupie girls' unglamorous, warts and all view of the music industry netherworld, with films like Slade in Flame and Stardust. Groupie Girl also proved to be a brief trendsetter within its own sexploitation genre. It can't be a coincidence that within a few months, Lindsay Shontiff was shooting his own groupie epic with Permissive. Even Val Guest's otherwise light and silly old pair girls takes a serious and dark detour into groupie territory at one point. In a more pornographic vein, the irrepressible George Harrison Marx also got in on the act with the hardcore short Autograph Hour, in which Clyde Rosen and her blonde friend play groupies who break into the house of a rocker called Randy Tool and end up getting their hands on more than just his John Hancock. Groupie Girls, predominantly 20-something cast and tying rock soundtrack album, earmark this as one of the earliest British sex films to actively court a younger audience. Even so, Ford's film is still a product of a time when sex films always tend to make a point of showing that there's a price to be paid for living life in the fast lane, an attitude reflected in the downbeat world views and ill-fated protagonists of such films as Secrets of a Windmill Girl, Loving Feeling, and of course Ford and Long's very own The Wife Swappers. Fast forward a couple of years and such hang-ups would be cast aside for the post-pill, pre-age revelry of the Confessions and Adventures films. Films far removed from Groupie Girl, where characters can die horribly in motorway accidents, get raped, or end up with messed up heads for their troubles. Grim as it sometimes is, there can be no doubt that Groupie Girl is a great, dirty little rock and roll film. One of the jewels in the crown of Ford and Long, and as good an entree into British exploitation cinema as you're likely to get. It's also relatively easy to find. A low priced DVD release has been around for a few years, and the film is actually up on YouTube in its entirety. Just run the film's title into that search engine, and Groupie Girl can be all yours for the night. After all, aren't all good groupies meant to be free and easy? Anyway, that's your lot, so all that remains for me to say is good night and God bless.